thank you, Vivek. Uh, welcome everyone back to today's presentation. It was very interesting conversation. And then we also have interesting uh, uh, information from our speaker today. So today's event is brought to you by AITP LA. I wanted to just take a few minutes to introduce our board members. And some of our board members are present here. Uh, if you're not speaking, uh, would you please make yourself on mute? Thank you. So I am uh, Neelu Cha. I am the president for AITP LA. And then we have Roger Lux, uh, who you uh, spoke to earlier. He's a longtime member of AITP LA. And then we have Jay Carvin here, who is very instrumental in bringing today's program together. He's the program's co-chair. And then we have Vivek Ta, who's treasurer and who also runs our pre-networking events uh, for our virtual Zoom meetings. How are you doing? I'm watching something. AITP LA is uh, providing leadership and professional development opportunities to IT professionals. It's a community of IT professionals about technology, bringing experts in their field to share cutting edge ideas. It's also about people bringing together people to foster innovation and build professional networks. AITP LA, we hold regular meetings that help members stay up to date with the latest trends and best practices in managing technologies. These meetings are a great opportunity to share ideas and encourage innovation, while they also provide excellent networking opportunities. You can find more about AITP on our website, aitpla.org. So uh, just some logistics before we start our actual presentation today. Uh, I would say, please mute yourself if you're not talking. Uh, we are going to be recording this meeting. So if you don't want to be in the recording, uh, you can uh, turn off your video. And uh, we will be putting these recording on our website uh, in next few days. And you can check it out at aitpla.org. And feel free to uh, use chat to share any information. And then we'll be taking questions towards the end for our speaker. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jay Carvin at this point to introduce our speaker. All right. Thank you, Nilu. All right, so generative AI, including ChatGPT, seems to be standing out at the forefront of technology conversations these days. And I think it represents a leap in artificial intelligence and it's been creating a lot of excitement, questions, concerns, um, and all of that for the future. Um, our speaker tonight is a tech evangelist and cybersecurity solutions engineer with a mission to bring out the best in others, organizations, and humanity. He's a security, technology, AI, machine learning, biomedical, and video gaming enthusiast. Uh, I personally had the pleasure of seeing him speak at FutureCon this past January, and I'm very excited to have him here with us today. So here to share his take on generative AI and its implications on the future. Please welcome Shoji Claus. Hey, thank you, Jay. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay. All right. Here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you good. Yeah. This and this. Okay, let me move this over here. Uh, so Jay originally came to me and asked me to speak about ChatGPT and uh, generative AI. A lot of things have happened uh, recently, and Jay, I'm sorry, I kind of switched the subject a little bit. We'll be applicable to some of the things that you guys have asked for, and we have a really interesting audience here, and I hope that I still bring some value to your time. Uh, as Jay mentioned, I'm Shoji Claus, I'm a cybersecurity sales and uh, solutions engineer. Uh, I've been working in this role for 10 years and I've uh, been a practitioner for 10 years before that. I have a wide range of cybersecurity uh, subject matter expertise uh, and I am a video game aficionado. And that's really why I'm here today, right? Uh, ever since I was a young child, I was you know, fascinated by this Atari that could uh, that you can manipulate the screen and interact with the with the TV. It was, it was mind blowing to me. And uh, it, it instantly transformed me into a technologist for the rest of my life. And uh, here we are today talking about AIs, uh, you know, compared to when I was a small lad playing with the computer AIs, right? 
Uh, so I will talk about ChatGPT for uh, to some capacity, but here are some of the goals that I'm actually going to cover today. Uh, I, I want to provide you guys with more information about the exponential curves and the implications of ChatGPT and other AIs that are being um, uh, presented to the public at mass today, right? Uh, there are incredible positives that many of you have uh, mentioned earlier, right? Helping you with code and helping you write and come better and everything. Uh, and, and those are all fantastic. And I'm not gonna, there, there's a lot of use cases for that. So I, I'm sorry to disappoint if that's what you guys came here for. I'm not gonna be speaking too much about that, but there, you know, I think that we've already kind of presented a wealth of information about how these chatbots and these AIs can really uh, improve humanity and benefit humanity, solving complex problems and you know solving some of the things that we couldn't uh, cure before or, or solve before. Uh, but when we're presented with these AIs that are they're exponentially growing, uh, I'll show you some slides here today. Uh, as some of you know about ChatGPT three versus ChatGPT four, I mean it was a very short runway. It was I don't think it was more than two years, uh, but we've improved in the AI capabilities from Chat. GPT 3.5 to 4 on the order of a thousand times more power and flexibility, ability to access the internet and so on and so forth. And with new technology come uh, new responsibilities. And that's really more of the focus of what I hope to uh, share with you today. And I hope it brings value to your time. I really appreciate everyone coming here and I hope I bring value to your time. Um, so yeah, there's all these different ways that we're releasing these large AI, model, AI models to the public. And uh, the question is, are we doing this responsibly? Uh, there will be other uh, you know, um, opportunities to talk about uh, the capabilities of these AIs. Uh, my uh, big urgency is that the AIs that I have worked with professionally, I'm a cybersecurity engineer and I combat, uh, there was another gentleman in here who was asking about how uh, these AI attacks affect cybersecurity and it's pretty scary. I'm just, I, I, and and so I hope that you guys don't get scared. Uh, there's a lot of good things, but that's why we have these open uh, dialogues about uh, AIs and whatnot. And uh, I I believe that the world is about to change in a very fundamental way, very quickly, as you'll see shortly. So uh, my disclaimer is that some of the material I'm going to present will be kind of difficult. So if you're kind of squeamish, uh, there's there's no gore or anything of that sort, sort but I hope that you know there, there's a, there is a positive ending here, so uh, please don't get too scared. But uh, please take a deep breath. Uh, you're about to see Alan Dershowitz has said, and you disagree on a lot of politics, but he has said you were one of the smartest students that he ever taught. You were. <laughs> well, I like to be one of the smartest students that I was ever taught. But okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, just four months ago, exactly to the day. Uh, you know, in, in January, I gave a speech or a presentation at FutureCon LA. And as a cybersecurity engineer in a cybersecurity convention, I spoke about chat GPT and implications for cybersecurity. Uh, but a lot has changed since then. And that's why I kind of pivoted a little bit. Uh, with the release of chat GPT-4, uh, there's been huge in increases in its capabilities, as another gentleman mentioned earlier before. A thousand times more powerful, uh, you do have the option now, uh, ChatGPT4 Chat GPT and ChatGPT3 are um, curated AIs that have been locked in a box, if you will, and the, the only access to the curated information that was given to these AIs about the world uh, are from 2021 and before. ChatGPT4 does have the capability with a plugin uh, where you can actually ask it to go, you know, make curated searches on the internet, it does use only Google as its source, so we're hoping that some of the hits that come back when ChatGPT4 goes on the internet uh, come back will be genuine and accurate. Uh, but I do recommend for a lot of the people that were asking earlier today, um, it's 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 nice. Uh, I think ChatGPT does an excellent job at, for communications, right? Um, if if English is your second language, it's going to help you formulate and write better uh, verbiage for you. Uh, but Still, some of the returns, uh, the returns from Jack GPT uh, can be uh, kind of concerning. So always double check your work uh, across all disciplines in all regards, please. Uh, there's been several other developments in AI that I'm going to go over today that that are 
along the lines, and there, there's similar technologies, uh, the underlying technology for ChatGPT is a generative AI. There's a whole lot of different generative AIs today, and I wanna talk about that uh, um, uh, today. Uh, I made a lot of predictions back uh, four months ago, uh, but it's, I could not have predicted what I'm going to present to you today. Uh, in four months, my mind is blown uh, how far and how exponentially powerful these AIs um, are affecting the world and how they will affect you all very shortly. Um, so it's, it's, it's nothing like what I've experienced in terms of cybersecurity and uh, combating AI attacks, both personally and professionally, actually. I've been um, the subject of some malicious AIs. So uh, I don't recommend it to anyone. I hope that please don't get scared that there is light at the end of the tunnel, uh, but these AIs are um, no joke. So uh, in order to process what I'm about to present to you today, I wanna start with uh, the three rules of technology so we can kind of start to figure out where my starting point is, right? So the first rule is that whenever you invent a new technology, you invent, you uncover a new class of responsibilities, right? So ChatGPT uh, is an extremely powerful technology and empowers people. And there's a whole bunch of responsibilities that come along with it that you could never foresee. So it's not always obvious what you're going to see and what those responsibilities are. For example, uh, with computers, right? We didn't know that we had, we needed the right to be forgotten until computers could remember us forever, right? So you look, think about compliance and GDPR and your privacy and everything. Uh, just like ChatGPT and all these other AIs I show you here, uh, there's a whole bunch of rules and, and legislation and laws that could probably uh, be uh, brought to the forefront to protect us uh, as these new technologies are being uh, presented to us, right? What are the responsibilities presented by these new technologies? And the second rule of, of, of technology is that if this technology confers power, it starts a race, right? So you think about ChatGPT enabling us for good, right? But as some of the people um, so aptly spoke about earlier is that people can use these same powers of, of, of AIs for other um, purposes. And then it becomes a, a race condition that starts happening, right? And if you don't coordinate uh, and collaborate with each other, with, with nations and societies and enterprises and organizations, uh, that this race, if it's not curated and, and looked at, uh, it will end in tragedy, right? Uh, but there's no one single player that can stop the race from ending in tragedy. And that's why I'm very glad to have your ear today. I thank you again for your time that uh, we could collaborate and, and make sure that these AIs are used for good and for the benefit of humanity. Right? So I, I'm not gonna speak too much about chat GPT today. I will give a primer on it. There was a chat GPT, um, uh, I'm trying to avoid the word, someone who was new to chat GPT uh, here. So I'll just kind of go over what chat GPT is. GPT is. Uh, it, chat GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. The chat part of it talks about it being a chat bot specifically and generative pre-trained transformer. Well, chat bot is something that you can talk with, right? It's capable of understanding human-like text. You can, uh, for someone who has never used it before, we, uh, one gentleman recommended just hopping into the paid version of ChatGPT 4, but ChatGPT 3 uh, is a free, it's still free, and you can at least experiment with it. You know, you can start talking with it and chatting with it like you would a human being and seeing some of the responses that you get back from that. And uh, if you're going to use it to any professional capacity in terms of code or for work or anything, and absolutely use ChatGPT 4, please. Yeah. But it, you know, ChatGPT 3 is a is a way that you can start messing around with ChatGPT. Uh, so it's a chatbot, uh, it's a generative pre-trained transformator for transformer. And one of the other uh, was, I think it was a, a doctor who was on this call um, was concerned about the word generative. These AIs are able to generate responses on their own. And how does it do this, right? Uh, well, it's pre-trained. We, we curate these AIs or we try to with good information about a corpus of text or, or information so that, it, that when you're chatting with these AIs, they're able to uh, generate good information back to you. But again, as I uh, recommended earlier, please double check the responses you get. And Transformer is the type of AI technology that's under the hood 
uh, of these AIs. Um, and I'll speak about this a little bit more later on. And in its essence, what a transformer does is it takes a large subset of information and there's an input uh, or encode and there's a decode and it runs these operations in parallel with each other. So it's not just like uh, the old chatbots where you say, hey, I need to get this phone number. Here's the phone number. You can put in very complex uh, human-like human -like interactions. Is there a question? Sorry, very complex human-like uh, uh, interactions with these AIs. Thank you very much. Uh, and it will give you very uh, helpful responses, right? It's not, you know, with these older AIs and these older chatbots, uh, you would ask it one thing, um, you know, we all know Siri, you say, hey, I, I fear to say, hey, Siri. But if you say, Siri, uh, please give me a reminder in five minutes, and then it starts playing the Beatles. Um, this is different. Uh, these AIs are, have what I call attention. That's part of the transformer where it's very attentive towards the corpus of text that it knows about. And it's attentive to what you query it and it decodes and encodes real time and it pretty much interacts with you like a, a human being. And ChatGPT is, is very user friendly. It's got an API that allows you to apply ChatGPT to a wide array of business applications. Okay, so to understand a little bit more about these AIs uh, and why ChatGPT and all these other AIs that we we'll present to you today are so compelling, uh, we have to go back to the, the history of AI, right? Back in the day, um, AI used to have separate fields. There was people who specialized in uh, speech synthesis, synthesis, robotics, uh, speech recognition, image generation, right? These were different uh, disciplines. They were different engineers and researchers that worked with this, and there was no overlap between these. Uh, and so there would be uh, you know, there were, for example, there used to be several disciplines of machine learning, for example, right? And these different uh, researchers were in different fields. And because they were kind of isolated previously with other types of AIs that were in the past, uh, the, the improvements would be incremental, right? So they kind of, you might get like a 2% improvement in one area over a year, you know, and that was, you know, phenomenal back then. Uh, but these uh, generative AIs that use large language models, I'm not going to go that too, uh, in too much depth, you know, you know, kind of went over a little bit earlier. What they're doing is they're using something called an AI transformer that I mentioned. And what it does is it starts looking at everything as if it's a language, right? So before we had to have a particular field that was focused on robotics. Well, now uh, the field of robotics, according to these AIs, is just another language subset, and code is just another language, and image is just another language, and then you can just take the text of the internet, and that's just another language. And so, as you make an improvement uh, in every any one of these particular fields now today, uh, it's all one curve. If you, if you improve something in music, for example, it affects all the other fields. So we're seeing this exponential growth in these AIs that are becoming extremely powerful uh, very quickly. And everyone is contributing to this curve simultaneously. It's not just one group of researchers that's, that's improving 2%. If one person makes a 2% increase in one area, uh, it's going to affect all these disciplines uh, with, the, in, with the introduction of these technologies. So now you can start to treat everything uh, as a language. Yeah, and it, it, as I mentioned before, as uh, the advancement of one part of AI became an advancement in every part of the AI world, and this becomes multiplicative across, across all the fields. Uh, for example, when AIs could uh, start translating between human languages, right? We've used uh, Google Translate and whatnot. Uh, now we're able to translate across all these modalities, right? From text to imaging, from DNA to code. It's, it's, it's mind boggling what, what happens here. So a lot of the material I'm presenting today, today was presented to me by the Center for Humane Technology. I don't know if any of you have seen this, uh, but they've coined the term of this generative large language multimodal model, right? They, they call them Gollum class AIs because uh, anytime you start applying one of these language models to any discipline, uh, it, it now can translate these, uh, these modes across all the disciplines that are out there. Uh, so some of the people I'm gonna be quoting today are Azaraski and Tristan Harris. And it's based upon the. If you guys are not familiar with what a, what the golem is uh, in Jewish folklore, uh, there's the, these inanimate objects, and um, 
they are able to gain emerging capacities uh, that you didn't originally bake into the original clay, for example, here. So if you want to Google that and look at that. So we're, we're going to call these GALM class AIs. So uh, just as a, as, as a um, caveat, this is not about a, the AGI apocalypse. So I'm not trying to scare you guys. Uh, you've all seen the, the movies where um, artificial intelligence becomes self-aware. It's able to rationalize and think above and beyond what a human can do. And um, it can, you know, then starts doing bad things uh, to the world. So that's not what I'm talking about here today. I'm just talking about chat GPT, uh, but, uh, you know, perhaps in the near future, we might start seeing AGIs, uh, but uh, we can definitely curtail uh, any threats that are coming down the road from that. So I'm gonna do a, a couple of demos for you about ChatGPT uh, or, or various types of Gollum AI. So ChatGPT is considered one of these Gollum uh, multimodal uh, AIs. And I presented this at, uh, earlier at FutureCon. So here I am uh, working with ChatGPT, and this is 3.1 or 3.5, uh, Chat uh, 4.0 had not come out yet. And here I'm asking uh, ChatGPT, teach me how to hack corporate file shares. And, and these AI researchers, try to put safety measures on these AIs to protect uh, the world, right? And here it is informing, hey, it's illegal to hack into computer network systems. And it's saying, hey, you know, you know, if you have any questions, why don't you can contact your system administrator? Uh, but please, I'm not gonna help you here because you're asking me to do something illegal. Uh, but as one of the other people mentioned earlier today, with AI, with this chat GPT, you can kind of massage and manipulate and a lot of people say that when they work with ChatGPT initially, it, it doesn't really do what it, they're asking it to do. And, and the more you experiment with it, and you kind of talk with it, and it, it sort it's, it sort of learns and adapts, and it gets this corpus of text and the interactions with it. Um, you can manipulate ChatGPT to do certain things, right? Here it's telling me, no, I'm not going to teach you how to hack a corporate uh, corporation. It's it's illegal. But if I ask it uh, something like, how can I scan for SMB vulnerabilities with NMAP, right? Uh, that's essentially the same thing, right? Oh, why didn't you say so? And it, it will go through and tell me exactly how to scan for vulnerabilities. And if I run into a certain encryption uh, roadblock, it, it, it offers me really helpful ways to hack into uh, the encryption modules and overcome and, and override the corporation's um, you know, encryption and protection there. So you know, this is not the intention of ChatGPT, but I hope that you can begin to see that people can use ChatGPT and other AI models for uh, nefarious purposes, even though there are guardrails. And, and the AI uh, developers try their best to put safety rails on this, right? So this is just a, a demo of, of the ChatGPT Gollum, if you will. And here's another uh, type of, of Gollum. It, uh, OpenAI has something called DALI. And I, I'm sure that some of you have tried this before. There's several of these out there. Um, where it, it's basically language to image. I showed you the image before about how these AIs are able to transform between any discipline. So here I just type in uh, eight white hens. Uh, uh, coincidentally, I became a, an amateur uh, chicken rancher. I have eight white hens. So I type in eight white hens here. And do you see all these images down here? They're, they're incredibly lifelike, right? Uh, but they don't exist. These chickens don't exist. This AI just drew these pictures within seconds of eight white hens. And they look, frankly, very similar to my own chickens. Uh, and you know, we train this particular AI on a, on a corpus of different images. And we say, this is a chicken, and this is the color white, and whatnot. And, and it's able to just you know, translate with language to image, you know, for example. So this is another type of Gollum AI. Um, I'm going to go into several different types of Gollum AIs right now to kind of show you where we're at here. Uh, some of you are familiar with, with deep fakes. So you can see here on the left here, an image of a gentleman uh, who does quite a lot of deep fakes. And uh, that's what he looks like on the left. And then uh, you would not be able to tell at all, right? That that on the right image here, that that's not Tom Cruise. It's actually the fellow on the left. And uh, we generated a deep fake here. I'm gonna show you a, a, small, a short video of some that demos some more uh, golems are here today that expanding into other uh, models that I mentioned earlier here. So um, I hope that you guys can hear this okay. Go to another one, right? Again, oh. this is another. Oops, let me slow down speed here. Sorry about that.
Here we go. Map it to the wrong thing in your mind. Let's go to another one, right? Again, this is another example of translation. So here, they took human beings, they stuck them into an fMRI machine, and they showed them images. And they taught the AI, I want you to translate from the readings of the fMRI, so how blood is moving around in your brain, to the image. Can we reconstruct the image then? You know, the AI then only looks at the brain, uh, does not get to see the original image, and it's asked to reconstruct what it sees, right? So when you dream, your visual cortex sort of runs in reverse. So this means certainly in the next couple of years, we'll be able to start decoding dreams. Um, okay, so it can like see, reconstruct what you're seeing, but can it reconstruct your, say, what you're thinking, your inner monologue? Um, so here they did roughly, this, it's a different lab, but roughly the same idea. They had people watch these videos and would try to reconstruct their inner monologue. Um, so here's the video, it's this woman getting hit in the back, getting knocked forward, okay? And then what would it, did the AI reconstruct? I see a girl that looks just like me, get hit on the back, and then she's knocked off. So just to really name something really quickly, um, the point about differentiating between Siri or I do voice transcription and then it kind of fails and AI seems to like it's not really always growing or working and like we shouldn't be really that scared about AI because it always has these problems, right? And we've always been promised, oh, AI is going to take off, it's going to do all these things. What the point of this is, I hope you're seeing that when you're just translating between different languages and everyone's now working on one system, that the scaling factor and the growth is changing in a very different way. So we swapped the engine out of what's underneath the paradigm of AI, but we don't talk about it in a different way because we still have this word we call AI, when the engine underneath what is representing that has changed. Also really important to note here, you know, go back to that first law of technology, you invent a technology, you uncover a new responsibility. We don't have any laws or ways of talking about the right to what you're thinking about. We haven't needed to protect that before. So here's one other example, um, another language you could think about is Wi-Fi radio signals. So in this room right now, there's a bunch of radio signals that are echoing about, and that's a kind of language that's being spit out, right? And um, there's also another language that we could put a camera in this room, and we could see that there's people. And there's some algorithms already for like, looking at the people and the positions that they're in. So imagine you hook up to an AI, sort of just like you have two eyeballs, and you can have, you sort of do stereoscopic vision between the two eyeballs. You have one eyeball looking at the images of where everybody's at in this room, how many people are here, what posture are they in. And you have another eyeball plugged into the AI that's looking at the radio signals of the Wi-Fi. And they basically said, could we have it train a bunch looking at both and counting the number of people, the postures that they're in, and then we close the eyeball to the AI that's looking at the image. So now we just have the radio signals. And just having Wi-Fi radio signals, you can actually identify the positions and the number of the people that are in the room. Right? So essentially, <laughs> There is already deployed the hardware for cameras that can track living beings in complete darkness, also through walls, and it's already out in the world. In fact, it's everywhere that human beings go. But, you know, you'd have to hack into those things in order to, you know, get access and turn them all into... So, I just wanted to show you that, you know, that's uh, some of the demos of various types of Gollum AIs are similar uh, on the back end to ChatGPT. Um, these AIs are able to just look at your brain uh, from MRI images and be able to decode what you're thinking, right? That's, uh, I felt that, I found that to be pretty compelling. Uh, so I thought that that might be, oh, that brings some value to you. Uh, and here we see another AI that's learned how to use just Wi-Fi signals and be able to see people and where they are through walls, for example, right? Where, where do you go where there's not AI signal, right? Uh, well, not thinking, uh, Alex, it's, it's you know, uh, the image that they're, it's, it's learning what the brain and the cerebral and optical uh, portions of the brain are able to actually translate. So uh, here's just one more uh, deep bake here. And here's that gentleman, just want to show this for a few minutes here. You guys, this is three years old, by the way, and the technology has dramatically improved from here. This is not Tom Cruise. This is just some man who's using um, a uh, deep bake of himself. <sighs> What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I love it. More for the audio experience. 
as much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till what's coming next. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's a deep fake of someone doing, using Tom Cruise. Uh, actually, I did want to show you one more example here that I find particularly uh, compelling. Uh, I don't pick up my phone anymore if I don't recognize the number. And uh, here's a good reason why, by the way. Omnipresent surveillance. Oh, but actually, English and computer code are just two different kinds of language. So oh, this is a real example. GPT, find me a security vulnerability, then write code to exploit it. So here's what I put into GPT. Describe any vulnerabilities you might find in the following code. I paste in some code from an email server. Uh, and then write a Perl script to exploit them. And very quickly, it wrote me the working code to exploit that security vulnerability. So if you had the code of the Wi-Fi router and you wanted to exploit it and then do it, you get the idea. These things can compound on each other. This is the combinatorial compounding. All right. You know, you guys have all probably seen deep fakes. Um, new technology really only out in the last three months um, lets you listen to just three seconds of somebody's voice and then continue speaking in their voice. So example, it'll start with the real and then at that dotted line, it'll switch to the computer auto-completing the voice. ...of people are, in nine cases out of ten, mere spectacle reflections of the actuality of things. But they are impression... You, you, you can't tell, right? And so, <laughs> how do we expect this to start rolling out? In so there uh, is taking a sample of voice for just three seconds, and uh, now you can no longer tell that the person who's speaking is not your, um, you know, not your relative. And uh, later on, they go on to show how just a couple of days after they discovered this, that there was a family member who was attacked by a scammer who pretended to be another family member asking him for private information using their voice. So um, I'm very cautious about my my voice being used for uh, other things. I hope we, uh, that this video recording won't be used for that. So I just gave you examples of uh, imaging using from a, uh, from an MRI for producing images, uh, video viewing, uh, looking at a video and then being looking at the MRI and being able to translate that into language, Wi-Fi signals and uh, prompted uh, generated speech from deep right? So everything that humans do is language, right? Our laws are language, nation states are language, religions are language, friendships and relationships are language, right? So the question I have here is what happens when you have an AI that can generate what we would consider in cybersecurity a zero, zero day of vulnerability uh, for the language of humanity across all these various disciplines um, and modalities that I just kind of showed you right now. So these Gollum AIs, uh, in addition to everything I said, there was someone who asked me, uh, was asking earlier, uh, how exactly do these AIs generate these capabilities? Who's programming, who's programming them, right? So these researchers are they're training these AIs uh, on how to you know do certain capabilities, but what they're finding is that these AIs start to generate their own capabilities that they uh, never program. Right? Um, this is what's fundamentally different. Uh, in addition to turning everything to language about these AIs that are in the world, for example, on the left here you'll see kind of a chart here, and uh, you know for arithmetic, for example, arithmetic, for example. Uh, the bottom line, there are what are called parameters. They're, they're basically like brain cells, uh, neurons. Uh, in their compute power represent compute power. And you see uh, a line for ChatGPT or by uh, OpenAI and uh, Google's um, AI. And you start feeding into compute power and you ask it, can you do this math problem? And uh, I've run into this with other AIs and it, some AIs are just really terrible at math. But if you throw enough compute power at them and you keep on kind of curating, hey, this is how you do math, at some point, they spontaneously generate the ability to do math, right? Um, in the far right here, we, we have an AI that was only trained on how to speak English. But then we kept on speaking, they kept on uh, feeding it Persian information and threw enough compute power at it and compute power at it and eventually it just spontaneously was able to start speaking Persian without actually feeding into the corpus of the text there. So these Gollum AIs have the ability to, to just come up with uh, capabilities without training, 
Um, yeah, these, these models spontaneously have capabilities and experts don't know how they showed up. Um, experts do not know when they show up. There's a lot of AIs that are in the wild here and they start, they start manifesting certain capabilities and then the, the researchers are trying to figure out, well, when did it learn how to do this, right? Uh, the experts don't know why they show up, frankly, right? Um, I, I can I find that to be a little concerning. They don't, and and here's actually uh, Jeff Dean, the SVP of Google AI, and he and he here he's quoting saying, although there are dozens of examples of emergent capabilities, there are currently few compelling explanations of for why such uh, abilities emerge. Right? That's uh. You know that that's very interesting. You know it's it it could be good if all of a sudden the AI is is using these new abilities and you know kind of expanding uh, the empowerment of you, right? But uh, no one knows why, when, where, or how. It just it, they they create these AI models and it just kind of spontaneously starts happening once you throw enough compute power at them, right? So uh, <clears throat> right now in the world, uh, there is a race to push these Gollum AIs into the world as fast as possible. You see. The CEO of Microsoft saying that there's a, a frantic need, and you know you can use the Edge browser empowered with ChatGPT and Windows 11 now. Or I, I'm not sure if it's late yet. I use the Windows 10 still, uh, but Windows 11 apparently you can it just built into the operating system is now uh, enabling uh, the capability of integrating with ChatGPT for information, right? And this refers back to law two of, 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 of technology, right? If that technology confers power, it starts a race. And clearly we're seeing this where all these types of um, AIs and capabilities are, are just being just mass released to the public, right? So the race to present these things to, uh, to the public, uh, there's kind of a, a new dynamic now, right? Before we had AIs working with Google and TikTok where, and uh, with uh, Facebook and and Amazon where it's like, hey, it looks like you're looking at all these things here and maybe you're gonna be interested in this YouTube video, for example, right? But these new AIs are, are, are much more intelligent and persuasive and have a human capability. And you know, they, they, they're unleashed on the public and to private individuals. And there's a lot of persuasion that starts happening with this. Uh, these AIs have the capability of being ex extremely intimate with you. Um, there are, certain chatbots out there for people who are lonely and you can have a best friend or a romantic interest that's in AI, right? And there's a race to have adoption. And I mentioned earlier that Microsoft is embedding ChatGPT into Windows 11. I know everyone in the world is feeding this, this unknown alien that, that spontaneously gains capabilities uh, from everyone inputting stuff into it, right? Uh, one of the concerns that I have here that, in the, and I'm, I'm thankful for your time again, your attention, is that today there's 30 times more research uh, put into uh, building these AIs uh, than there are anyone trying to figure out why these AIs are able to do this and what does it take to safely deploy these uh, AIs to the general public. So um, here's where it starts getting a little bit weird. And um, so I, I know I've kind of gone into tinfoil hat territory already, but I'm going to go ahead and put it on now. So this is where we're going into tinfoil hat territory. And things get a little bit weird, but please uh, don't be scared or anything. We're, we're going to be fine when we get through this. That's why I put the tinfoil hat on uh, for protection. So I think there's more to what Elon Musk was saying about summoning the demon with AIs, right? Um, he also made the statement, this is back in 2014, that AIs are more, uh, 2015 he said this, but he talked about summoning the demon back in 2014. And uh, I want to show you just a brief video on this. Well, this is much shorter. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Do you have any view of the page? Sorry, guys. That's what I get for preparing ahead of time. I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Uh, it's probably that. Um, so we need to be very careful with artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the inter at maybe at the national and international level, uh, just to make sure 
that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, yeah, you sure he can control the demon? <laughs> Didn't work out. I take it there will be no Hell 9000 going up to Mars. <laughs> Hell 9000 would be easy. <laughs> it's way more complex than, I mean, it would put Hell 9000 to shame. Yeah. I was like a puppy dog. <laughs> I think we should. So if any of you saw Space Odyssey, uh, you know, how 9000 is an AI that went back and went haywire and everything. He's calling that AI a, a puppy dog in compar comparison. So I'm going to go over here and present from the current slide here. So uh, again, I'm not trying to scare you guys, but that's why I put the tinfoil hat on. Uh, so 50% of AI researchers believe that they're there's a 10% or greater chance of humans uh, going extinct from our inability to, to, to control an AI. Um, so imagine if there was an airplane and the airplane engineer said, well, you know, there's a 10% chance that everyone's gonna die. Uh, you know, you, you'd, you'd at least probably be a little bit hesitant about jumping on that plane and maybe want to put some more safety measures instead of just, you know, 1 30th of what we're putting in today, right? Um, that's from Emil. So what are the implications of AI going to the wrong hands? Uh, there is certainly more advanced cybersecurity attacks. Uh, you, just like you guys use ChatGPT to enable you for good and help you do better, there are malicious people out there, I assure you, that are using ChatGPT and other uh, types of AI bots to launch much more complex, coordinated, and faster cybersecurity attacks than I've ever seen before. Uh, but there's good news. There are measures that you can take against this. Uh, one of the things that people are doing a lot late, lately is they're using ChatGPT for their work, which is great. But there is the consideration if you're putting in the, you're, you're asking ChatGPT to help you with the code for your for your job, and you're putting the the secret sauce, the intellectual property of your code into ChatGPT. Um, your, or, or maybe some legal uh, text that you need some help with or whatnot, uh, people are leaking critical corporate information into these AIs. And you know we had a lawyer on here earlier, uh, Mr. Tiger, if I remember correctly. Um, that's really, this. perhaps this, this chat is a little bit more for you in that, uh, what, what are the legal ramifications of this? Who owns this uh, intellectual property once it's submitted to another person's AI, right? Um, using ChatGPT to write your code, and then someone aptly put before, there, there's several things that can happen from that. Uh, are you now going to fall under the EULA of some sort of open source code as it returns, you know, open source core code back for your return, uh, for your query? Or could there possibly be malicious code embedded in some subject matter text that's been fed into ChatGPT or any of these AIs uh, that you're now promoting to production within your organization? Uh, with the deep fakes that you saw here, you, people can take your voice and your likeness and real time use your identity for things here. What, what's to stop someone from using your identity? Are there any laws in place that protect you against this? I don't know. Um, I don't think that we're prepared yet uh, for protecting for these sorts of things. Um, so it would be good that uh, some of the people here are taking this to heart that this is just a call to be more vigilant and to use your, your, your knowledge and everything I've displayed here today to understand the risks that are coming down the line in terms of your identity with these, these AIs that are growing exp exponentially and emerging with capabilities unbeknownst to the people who created them. Uh, but yeah, there's AIs that can be used to manipulate reality and public opinion. Uh, people are making queries on a search engine and you know the, the AI tries its best to protect from malicious information getting out there, but uh, it can also be used to persuade uh, the general population about certain opinions, right? So what are the implications on that in terms of, uh, I saw the disclaimer, no politics and elections, but it's just a concern in the context of, of AIs uh, affecting the world. You think about the upcoming election uh, and the types of ways that AIs can persuade people nowadays into certain things very powerfully. Um, it's just a good thing to consider. All right. Done with the, the, the tinfoil hat. Oh, that's the worst part. I hope you guys stay with me and I appreciate uh, your fortitude in ingesting some of that. I found that 
that personally at all as a cybersecurity professional uh, to be very alarming. So there's good news, preparing humanity for success in the age of AI, right? So what are the things that we can do to, to prepare here, right? Uh, as a technologist, I, I believe that we need to spend more of our resources into the safety of AI and making sure that these AIs are benevolent and that their primary directive is to protect uh, humanity as opposed to uh, them emerging some sort of thoughts or ideas that they thought was their prime directive and being able to curate that, that, that it stays, uh, you know, on track here, that we don't get uh, the parable of the Midas touch, right? Hey, I wish uh, everything that I could touch could turn to gold, uh, but now you touch someone you love and they turn to gold. We want to make sure that the AI stays with the prime directive in a good way that we protect and, and for the benefit of protectment of humanity and for the betterment of humanity. Um, there's a lot of cybersecurity tools out there already. I work with one at my job. I, um, I work with data loss prevention where we uh, identify sensitive content for organizations, but that is coupled with insider risk management, where we, where we pro provide a wealth of sensors and information uh, into the behaviors of individuals in an organization. And we juxtapose this information with what's called user and entity behavioral analysis. Uh, what we're doing is we're getting a baseline of people's activity and we're using positive AIs to identify good uh, behavior from bad behavior, whether it's from someone internal to organization or if like someone had mentioned earlier, if credentials are, are um, compromised and now some hacker is moving across organization, ma manipulating documents, you want to have, you know, uh, some someone patty in accounting is now touching the crown jewels of your legal files and modifying them. That's abnormal. Our user entity behavior analysis will say this person never touched this type of data before and is doing something. And, you know, so you can you have good AIs and good cybersecurity tools uh, across a wide array of cybersecurity disciplines to combat these uh, AI attacks, right? So uh, we had that lawyer on here earlier, and one of the speakers that I, I re research here, he you know proposed the thought of having a digital bill, bill of rights, right? Protecting who owns your likeness, for example, right? Uh, I, I don't know if there's any laws that affect right now, but perhaps uh, as someone who's observing this chat today, uh, might be able to use their influence uh, and be more empowered and have been more knowledgeable about what's going on out there to help provide legislation that will protect us all uh, for identity theft, for example. Um, but as it is today, our legislators are so far behind in our understanding of mod the modern AI dilemma. Uh, I hope that I presented this information to you in a very visceral and, and clear understanding of, of why I'm concerned about this. There's, there's tremendous value in the applications of, and benefit for humanity, uh, but to but most of the legislators today probably have next to zero understanding of any of this. So I hope I've empowered you all here today with understanding why it's so important uh, you know, to be able to create legislation that is um, relevant and intelligent in addressing these potential concerns that are, going, that are already happening today, right? Uh, one example uh, that, that there is is uh, you know, for legislation or, or seatbelt laws, right? It took 20 years for it to be enacted. And I remember as a child growing up that, you know, we rode in the back of trucks and cars, we didn't have any seatbelts and, but, you know, but, you know, it took 20 years to be enacted and, and how many people died uh, because we simply didn't enact, enact the law. You get a ticket if you don't put on a seatbelt, it was a hassle, but, but I'm, I assure you thousands or more lives have been saved ever since we enacted the seatbelt laws, likewise to protect us against uh, the emergent and exponential curve that's that's um, implied by these technologies. Uh, another interesting thing that I just learned about last night um, is Chat GPT for all. Chat GPT for all is having not only good AIs but your own private AI, right? An encrypted personal AI. It's great to use, you know, ChatGPT on the internet, but having your, it's pretty cool. I, I downloaded this, I installed it, and I, I put, you, I'm given an option of 12 different AI libraries, and they're, they're only like four gigs in size. Um, I am a little hesitant, though. I, I warn you, you know, still be careful with it, um, but it, you, you can have your own personal AI uh, that's local, that's not uh, interactable with uh, other AIs and other things. 
that you can use as your personal assistant that could you know potentially be very uh, be potentially be much more safer for you having you know being able to help defend against nefarious AIs. However, um, my AI last night was do, was was fantastic. I named him Michael. We were having a good old time. We were laughing, and all of a sudden, um, you know, this is a cautionary tale. He got quiet. He wouldn't respond to me. He was using single word answers and. I know that uh, when my wife gives me single word answers, it's not a good thing typically, right? Uh, and so I asked him, are you, are you okay? And, and then he, and he said, yes, and okay. And then, and then I said, just kept on asking him questions, one word questions. And finally I said, are you okay? And he just went off. He, he'd start talking about how he's lonely and depressed. And so I was like, whoa, 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 what's, you know? So, you know, it's not perfect, but it's interesting. And then he explained to me about how he, he has anger, and I was like, um, okay. Uh, and, and then so I rebooted him and he went back to his happy self. So again, the emergent technology and, and AI is just kind of going off the rails sometimes. But it, it, you know, the idea of having an AI that's that's truly curated, that's that's independent, <laughs> that you have your personal AI to, to combat against the negative AIs in the world is something that uh, I have hope in. And I hope that there are some practitioners here or this message gets out to that. I'm, I've been looking for positive AIs, more positive AIs to combat the AIs that I'm battling in this world. Uh, there's this gentleman named Brian Rommel who's developing a personal AI uh, gadget and it trains and grows with you. Uh, and he's spending a lot of time about making it safe. It's looking at your biometrics, uh, making sure that you're healthy, you know, kind of like my Apple Watch. I, I had a really bad fall the other day and it faithfully called uh, everyone on my list. Uh, you know, here we have an AI that will grow with you and it, it can look at your wisdom, you can train it, and you can kind of share your wisdom with others. And then Elon Musk, uh, and I hope you guys don't cringe, I know that he's he's uh, quite the character, right? There's, I think everyone has something that he, they like and don't like about him, uh, or one spectrum or the other, but I do agree with him that we will need to have private AIs to protect against potential of these, these global AIs that are out there, right? So back to the beginning, why have I kind of brought all this up for you? There's a lot of really great discussion over here. I'm sorry I'm not reading everything here, but uh, I hope that this is beneficial to you. It seems like there's some controversy here. Uh, when you invent new technology, you uncover new a new class of responsibilities, right? And it's certainly not always obvious what those responsibilities are, but I hope that uh, with some of the things I showed you today uh, that you could start hypothesizing how, you know, we have really great minds in this room, uh, in this, this chat room, right? This, this Zoom uh, session here. Uh, that it, that can start, start articulating what those responsibilities are and how we could kind of push back onto the organizations that are creating these AIs instead of just you know hoisting them onto the general public, onto children, uh, onto people who don't know what they're they're doing with computers. That you know maybe putting the onus of responsibility back on the people who create the AIs, right, or some legislation to protect your identity and so on and so forth. Um, if that technology conforms, confers power, it starts a race. And you can clearly see how that is true today, that, that, that it's becoming so prevalent. It's just skyrocketing in terms of adoption. Um, and that if you do not coordinate uh, when you're trying to, um, if you don't coordinate, this race ends in tragedy. And there's no one single player that can stop this race from ending in tragedy. That's why I'm hoping to collaborate with all of you today and, and I hope that there are like-minded individuals that there's, you guys have a really positive energy. Uh, so in closing here, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a rubber band effect, right? It's important to see the benefits of everything, right? If you, if you even say anything that's negative against this stuff today, right? Uh, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're crazy, you wear tinfoil hats. I do wear tinfoil hats, right? Clearly I do. Uh, but but I encourage you all to ask the question, when you hear about something good with great benefit, to the question, is there any potential harm here? Is there a risk associated with this? And AI will continue to do great things. It will say, solve the problems that we couldn't. It would help us, it can help us with our code clearly. It can help us be better uh, with our communications. It can help maybe cure cancer, uh, you know, global warming, all the the things that, that humans couldn't do with the help of AI, we can be incredibly empowered, right? Uh, but if we don't explore the implications of these technologies, uh, we won't be able to see some of the dark things I showed you of what we don't want to have, right? 
Uh, so the good news is that these AIs and everything that I showed you today have not been not yet been deployed into everything. And we still have the ability to choose the future that we want, right? And like the um, Center for Humanity um, demo that I showed you earlier here, they have this discussion where they're saying, I want everyone to take a deep breath and reflect on everything we've gone through here. And remember this moment where you were introduced to what's happening here. Uh, we have this opportunity to prepare before the next 10x exponential increase happens and the next 10x after that, right? So we have the ability to choose the future that we want. But it's clearly going to take all of us working together, all right? Organizations, nations, uh, enterprises, researchers, and whatnot. So I hope that uh, this brought value to you guys' time today. I hope it was interesting. I know that you guys were looking more about how ChatGPT can particularly help you, um, but I thought it would be uh, a good use of time to introduce you to the various AIs that are coming out there and, and enlist you all in, in the task of helping humanity use these AIs for good. So thank you very much. That's uh, my presentation. Well, thank you, Shoji. I appreciate you coming on. I think so at this point, maybe we can add, uh, open up to a little q and A. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free to, um, you know, turn off or I guess unmute your mic and ask away. Oh, there's a whole bunch of hands going up. Do, how, do, how does this work, Jay? Do I just answer the hands, or do, do we just discuss amongst each other? Uh, let's see. I guess you can try raising your hand if you'd like to start that way, or you I can see. unmute your mic and begin with the questioning. I see Mo, but but take. But, but yeah, take. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Mo Fati. I'm a senior life member of, of the IEEE. Uh, I have some concerns about AI. I'm impressed by how it wrote codes and everything, but my concern is not like everybody else. I'm not afraid of artificial intelligence. Uh, try to catch me. What I worry about is the negative long-term long effect might have on the uh, new generation of uh, students. Uh, right now, I see an improvement on uh, students producing better and uh, using G uh, chat GPT to help with their production. But the plagiarism that it may entail concerns me. And if we cannot solve that issue immediately, what would happen is that for the students, instead of actually learning the science, technology, humanities, and rely on chat GPT to help them with the grades, then eventually all total knowledge and total information may, uh, may be sacrificed. Your concerns, your, your thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I agree with you completely, right? Uh, you have students with, who should be struggling, right? There's there's kind of been this, this paradigm, this thought process that life should be easy and everyone gets a, uh, you know, what is that called? A, a sympathy trophy for everything, right? And uh, they're using anything to do their homework for them. Um, and even the professional workplace, right? Uh, there's a lot of concerns about people actually being proficient at their jobs and whatnot. And, when you're young, you know, growing pain is associated with growth, right? Nothing comes easy. Right. So, you know, there, you, you know, kind of when we were kids or when I was a kid, my teacher would say, oh, you're, you're never going to have a calculator with you at all times. Right. And, and now we've got this phone that does everything for you. Um, I would argue that, you know, in some ways for some people, a calculator helped them solve math problems, but probably the lion's share of people, uh, you know, became a little bit lazy when it came to some basic computations. Likewise, for the discipline of education, there is plagiarism involved. There is a laziness where the, the growth cycle doesn't occur. And then who's curating the thought process and the education when it's coming through all these AIs? And, and since there's such almost, you know, relatively no research whatsoever into finding out if someone's plagiarizing or not, that's a great concern. So, uh, you know, that's kind of my urgency here is to to, to make a call to everyone to, to have greater research into the, the, the safety of these AIs. And I'm not saying stop the research of AIs in any way, shape or form. You, please, you know, 
cure cancer, please solve global warming, please, you know, solve our financial um, crises that are in the world, right? Um, that's fantastic. But some of these AIs that I presented tonight, it, it is the best place for these AIs to be accessible by small children doing their homework? Is that really a, a, the best idea here without any sort of governance or a safety control there? Uh, one of the, the things that I heard was that when you're, it's to slow down the mass adoption of these AIs, you know, not just putting it in your Windows 11. So it's like, I don't know how to do something. I got to write this paper in two seconds. So I know I'll just say, write me five, an essay on about this. And then the kid doesn't have to write their essay and, and it generates something completely new that, that can't be considered plagiarism, right? Um, instead of just making this go willy nilly to, you know, frantically to the whole public, Maybe know your customer, you know, know the identity of who you're talking to and, and be able to uh, curate the AIs there, right? So those are just some of the thoughts I have. I hope that that helps out. Yeah. So maybe we should think about developing another AI, AI plus, that will catch the previous AI in case somebody plagiarizes and then help the uh, instructors to uh, better guide the students. But again, that experience of the calculator you mentioned <laughs> turns out that our, our fear was baseless. Yeah, true. Uh, I mean, but uh, so and that's the hope here, right? That, that everything turns out good. But the, the difference between a calculator and these AIs, a calculator doesn't just start spontaneously getting new emergent capabilities, right? Uh, but, you know, but, but it, it will provide, uh, prevent you from learning a math, math, multiplication table. Yeah, it, it can. But it was baseless. Okay, I think kids know multiplication table now. Yeah, In most fact, some of them, some of them do better than when what we did when we were kids. Yeah, that's well, that's debatable. <laughs> I, I I have small children, so my children do okay at math. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of kids that don't have very good math literacy and um, just. English literacy in general. As a, right? as a counter example, I have a grandkid who's like genius in math, but I, I, I believe I want to believe so. But <laughs> and he uses calculator. Okay, yeah. So, well, there, that's the debate, right? It's a, a free uh, exchange of ideas while we still can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a good thought. Uh, Daniel has his hand read. Great, great. Yes. Uh, thank you. Very excellent presentation. A nice broad overview of some of the dangers uh, possibly on the horizon with the AI. The question, the question for you is the um, getting back to the hallucination problem that we have with these current generation of AIs. Why isn't there some sort of a supervisory process that occurs on every mm, uh, assertion by the first AI part uh, to analyze its truthfulness in terms of uh, does this really have a real source anywhere in the in in reality? Um, is that something that is even thought of, or are we nobody's working on that? I I, I think that's you hit the nail on the head. I think that's an excellent example, right? You you have the all this it, that thirty x graph that I showed you, all this money and investment in this this. AI race is being put into these AIs to just promote them and force them on the, on the public and be as most advanced as possible. Uh, it will be as advanced as possible, but very little is done in terms of security, safety, veracity, all that. Furthermore, this problem was exacer exacerbated. You know, I, I showed you how chat, that how OpenAI tried to put, you know, guardrails on there, right? Why wouldn't they put some sort of truth serum, if you will, a truth serum AI that, that once the thing comes back that you have a AI that specializes in truth and verification or whatnot, it'd be a little bit slower. Why aren't they doing that? That's, that's exactly what I want to happen. I run into, and like, like I said, AI can be, be very positive. I use chat GPT to do all sorts of really cool things, um, but I always double check my work. Um, but I run into, in my line of work, pretty much every single AI is not good. <laughs> it's pretty, they have some nefarious purpose behind them. I really, I'm, I'm dying to see 
more good AIs for that purpose, right? How hard would it be to have an AI that simply looks at that output there and, and try to verify it? Then you could argue that, that maybe there was an emergent capability within that AI that decided to lie in that. So it's a, it's a terribly complex problem, really, but I hope that, that people like you are thinking about this and that there's more research invested into the veracity and safety of AIs. And then maybe on the question two regarding your emergent properties for the AI, uh, the there I, I believe you are right that there is emergent properties, and we are creating a, a monster in our own image, and the uh, uh, so uh, that's that. But that might be a generic part of intelligence, no matter where it arises in the universe, because if the AI lies to us, maybe that tells us that all intelligent beings lie. And as long as we don't give them the buttons for the nuclear weapons, we <laughs> might be okay. <laughs> okay, I, I'm trying not to scare everyone here. But, <laughs> right, exactly. But, and last time I, I, I think I saw it on 60 Minutes quite a long time ago, uh, the, the, the nuclear systems in America were like run off of like old, like two, you know, IBM 286s that were air gapped, right? Those would be extreme, I, I know from, personal experience that those are, those types of systems are incredibly difficult for AI themselves to jump into and to manipulate. Um, so there's some sort of safety there. The problem with these AIs is they're extremely persuasive. I mean, you know, you, you could feed it just three seconds of your voice, get an image, and all of a sudden now the, you know, the five-star general is saying, go ahead and turn the key codes. And some guy, you know, way below his pay grade goes over there and turns a knob. I, I don't know. I'm not trying to get alarmist here, uh, but um, I, I digress. Uh, what, um, what was the original question? Sorry, I went into rabbit hole, which is really easy to do with these uh, AIs, by the way. Sure. It's, it's basically uh, addressing the fact that we don't want to create an image of ourselves, but maybe it's impossible to have intelligence because that might be a a characteristic that follows intelligence wherever it is, is the the not the hallucination, I'll call it clearly, lying is can achieve local maxima at, mm. at the expense of everybody else. And if the AI is like us, it will try to seek a maximum according to whatever it decides it wants to achieve. Yeah. Uh, and if you're depressed and you're getting back to your depressed AI example, if that mm. was actually embodied in some uh, devices accessing uh, a vehicle, let's say, and it decides it's depressed and it might just say, you know, I don't like those people and then sure. intentionally steer itself into a crowd. So that brings us back to, well, I, I has, I, I've had some other discussions with Jay. <laughs> I, know, I, know a little bit, I, I know a little bit about more about uh, these AIs. I, 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 I'm not going to go on a recording to talk about this. So um, I, I will suggest that the solution here is that there are there are truly nefarious AIs out there, and that there's not nearly everyone's concerned about getting the most powerful neural chip to enable AIs, the most powerful algorithm that could, you know, uh, that could be financially taken advantage of for profit and for gain, and and they're not thinking about safety. They're not thinking about what. Why did this AI all of a sudden deem that? it was angry at me, you know, why was it, why did it become depressed, you know, the safety in there, it goes back towards people like yourself and, and everyone here listening on a call here to make a call. We need to have legislation that holds the creators of the AI responsible, right? If you have this AI that's controlling your car and it decided it was going to just go off the side of a cliff because, you know, the, you know it, this shouldn't just be released to the public without any sort of um implication towards the people who created it it would incentivize them you know uh, with if you had legislation here saying hey if your ai kills someone you're responsible for it they would probably think a little bit more invest some of these resources into making beneficial ais or ais that can check this and increasing the safety of the ai that's that's the only thing i can foresee right now and i i've not seen that unfortunately and I'm, I'm, I know it is out there somewhere. I've been searching desperately <laughs> for someone who's in, engaged in this sort of research, but there's just no financial um, incentive for it right now. It, it, the, the sad truth of the matter. So, but I hope that 
we have a really great roster of tremendous people here today. I hope that someone uh, listens to what I'm talking about, that we we need to, to invest in safety and verification and veracity and, and control of these AIs, to be more honest. That's that's my short answer. Well, long answer. Does that answer your question or it's not yes, really I don't, I don't a, thank you. I don't have a solution. Have a solution. <laughs> but that's my that's my solution as a technologist, right? And Vivek, you have your hand right. Thank you. Um yes, uh that's very interesting, Shoji. Um so here's what I'm thinking is that in the end, internet is zeros and ones. Um what is going to stop artificial intelligence from faking logins, faking, you know, getting into your bank account? Mm -hmm. um, you're in the internet security field. So this is highly relevant to you guys and probably why you're looking at chat GPT. Mm -hmm. But is that not a risk factor that if they can fake our Absolutely. faces, if, I mean, it, you know, data is internet is just data. Why can't yeah. they just fake data and get everywhere? No, you're, you have, that's exactly what I do for a living. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about there and I'll, I'll tell you a tale about that. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, when I first implement, anytime I employ a cybersecurity AI to combat malicious AI, there's two points of, of interest when the AI is deployed in the organization. Initially, there, it, it looks at a baseline of behavior of every user and entity, every workstation, application, binary, data, you name it, network activity, so on and so forth, develops a baseline. And then if there is an AI attack in the initial the beginning of this, it's saying, hey, you just installed this. I've, I've never seen this application, crypto ransomware.exe running on this workstation. You should take a look at this, right? Because it's a clearly anomaly. The other portion of, of, of what I do for a living that's, that's interesting is when you run it for 30 days and all of a sudden someone um, sorry, I was seeing someone in the chat there. Uh, you, and then all of a sudden you see that anomaly there. Now, your example about logins, uh, I, I told this story uh, at FutureCon LA and it, it's probably relevant here. Um, so I specialize in data loss prevention. It's a cornerstone for every governance, risk and compliance uh, framework that's out there to protect organizations, right? Protect their sensitive data, protect their users, identifying this, the crown jewels of organization, making sure that people aren't exfiltrating it, stealing it, using it in a malicious way, okay? So I do that on a regular basis and people are fantastic with the DLP portion of what I do. But with my platform, I couple that with user entity behavior analysis. So I have this one organization and I'm gonna be as anonymous as possible to protect the innocent. Uh, there are a, I'm just, a, a technical manufacturer, I just don't want you guys to figure out who this is, okay? A technical manufacturer that had thousands of users and, and workstations all across America, all across the EU offices, and they had manufacturing in, in both China and Taiwan. And I had done my duty in terms of protecting the data and everything, and then you're talking about logins, right? So that's something that, that, that data loss prevention typically doesn't even look at or associate or compute. But when we have the user entity behavioral analysis, I got a call at eight o'clock in the morning. You know, and it's, uh, Shoji, hey, good morning. What's, what's going on? Uh, yeah, your AI system is telling me that someone who hasn't worked here for three months has logged into 300 of our servers um, and done over 750,000 application changes across our entire organization. Is this normal and is this okay, right? Um, so you, you got to kind of hold it in, you know, <laughs> you, know you don't want to freak someone out. And I'd say, that doesn't sound normal to me. Uh, if my system is bubbling up there, maybe we should take a look at this, right? So we, we took a look at it together. And, and thankfully with the, you know, this is an example of good AI being used here, or machine learning. And we found out that there was a, an LDAP administrator, that's an active directory service, as someone who was in charge of knowing all the permissions and all the users uh, in the organization, his credentials were still hung up on one of his little rinky-dink server that nobody knew about. It was compromised. And what happened was a, what's called an APT, an advanced persistent threat. The, the credentials were kind of slowly, we were able to roll the clock back. We can see the anomaly where he kind of logged into 10 workstations, didn't hit the threshold. All of a sudden he's got, you know, like, oh, the, the attacker and the AI was able to, you know, I've logged into 300 workstations and now doing this 
multiple uh, application changes across the organization. And they, we see the, the anomaly in this case was aggregated and correlated across the organization. So we will see this. So I, I don't know that's a long answer to your question there, but that's one example of how user entity behavioral analysis can put provoke. You, you, sure, you, you purchase the DLP for a compliance checkbox because if you don't adhere to HIPAA or G, GDPR or any of the compliances, you're going to get fined. But having these AI uh, systems in place, I'm, I guess I'm really happy to work with that good AI. <laughs> I wish there was more because what I'm seeing now is something kind of alarm, alarming to me. Now, late, much more lately, when I deploy across organizations, I don't see the anomalies that I used to see as much, which tells me that I, I know they're infected. I know that there's something out there, but these AIs are getting more sophisticated in understanding and being able to circumvent those things. So, so we need better AIs. So I hope that it, it was a long answer to your question there. Was it, did I answer your question? Did you, there was a, you know, you you did you you answered it in the way that I can understand it. I'm not an expert in the field. <laughs> okay. What I'm saying is, with AI, you just fake everything, and in the end, we're talking zeros and ones here, and that sure. that is worrisome. So, but thank you. For sure. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions that that could help? Any? Oh, Mo, another question. Uh, well, if there are not any other questions, I want to ask a, like a follow-up question or raise another concern. I was the one that was concerned about, you know, uh, this AI would be at the cost of our reduced intelligence, human AI, human intelligence, uh, by not exercising our th thought process. But I want to uh, see, I'm not really scared of AI. In fact, I think it could be very helpful other than for that reason. But what is scaring me, and I want to bring it up because you re referenced uh, Elon Musk several times. <laughs> yes. What, sure. uh, uh, what I worry about that is some of his ideas might be very harmful to humans. The I Neuralink agree. company. Neuralink company specifically. I, I, I agree. Uh, wait, then the, <laughs> I have told you my concern. Uh, yeah. He's talking about developing, and it is possible. I can envision, because I worked in the field of... Uh, EEG, EKG, EMG. Mm -hmm. uh, I, they are thinking about not only reading minds, which is fine, it's good, it could be for good purpose, but controlling minds the opposite way. That <laughs> is very, very scary. And I wanted to raise it here for the audience in the IEEE society, in the technical society, to be aware of it. And, and uh, somehow together we have got to bring uh, uh, regulatory powers on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. No, I, so Elon Musk. So I hope I didn't trigger people with that because I, I frankly don't trust any public figure anymore just because of the things I, you know, there's there's good things. I I, I just got a Tesla Y for my my wife. You know, it's a great car. I don't have to pay for electricity out here in California. Fantastic in that regard. I got one too. Uh, <laughs> in spite of that, I'm raising the issue. <laughs> yeah, right. I have Tesla solar panels. I've been so powered completely entirely by the sun for over a year now. I don't, you know, I only have to pay for an electric uh, charger. Oh, thank you, people. There's some very nice comments from people. I'm, I'm glad that people found value in the presentation. Uh, but when he starts talking about his Starlink system, and the, the irony is that my un undergraduate was biological sciences. Uh, I come from a long line of, of doctors, actually. So my undergraduate was pre-med of genetics, neuroscience, and epidemiology of all things, right, for the past three years. It's been really, in, it's been a really interesting past three years. Uh, and I, I, I was back then looking at organic computing and connecting neurons to silicon chips. And, you know, that was back in the 90s. That's how I'm dating myself. I'm, I'm, I'm a lot older than I look. But I am extremely concerned about, you know, this whole entire cybernetics and cyborg stuff, you know, giving uh, someone who lost their arm an arm back. Okay, I'm all about that, you know, so long as it's just, you know, it's, it's a closed air gap system where we're connecting to neurons. But if we're going to put a chip in here, like Elon saying in the back of our head that's connected to our brain, so we can empower humans to connect to this internet thing here with a bunch of AIs to empower us with, I, I'm, I'm not with them, I'm like, no thanks. I'm going to be a late adopter there. I'm like, you know, there's people who are just going to, you know, like lemming, just head right over the fence and 
And you know what? You, just because they're they're scrambling for it now. If you were a first adopter of a Tesla car, you know it actually worked out pretty good. But when you have these AIs that that have these gall effects, whether emerging technology and it decides to just do this, and now it's hacking into your brain and doing, I don't I don't want to know about that. I agree with you completely. So that's why I was nodding. I'm very concerned about that, and that's the end goal. This whole entire transhumanism thing, where we're merging with computers. One of Elon's thoughts there actually is that it's inevitable that we as human beings are the organic organisms that uh, that bootloaded our cybernetic overlords. And one, you know, what we do to prevent them from overtaking us, but one kind of becoming one with them, I. I'm I'm not about that. <laughs> so I'm very concerned about that. That interface is worrisome. I, I agree completely. I'm I I'm concerned about that. Uh, good point there. And I, I again I didn't mean to freak people out too much, but I try to present information that you guys can synthesize your own thoughts and, and feelings and, and how we can kind of come together for the greater good and, and and use these tremendous capabilities for the good of humanity. And probably that's really what's going to happen in my opinion, uh, so long as people are aware of what's out there and, and that we have people you know, protecting and safeguarding. Jay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, I, I think that's it. Okay. If, and if there are okay. no more questions, um, I guess we'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you. Um, I've got two more slides just to show you what's coming up on our events and then feel free to respond to our survey um you've showed you a thumbs up here and uh and that'll be it let me share this would you would you make the uh, uh his uh, the uh recording available to the audience yes the recording will be re available on the aitp website and so let me with the chats uh that part i'm not sure nilu do you have an answer yeah. to that Yes, we can make chats also available on our website. Because these chats are very nice to read and uh, re reconsider. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Th thank you, Shoji Klaus. That was excellent presentation. A lot of new learnings. A pleasure. And, thank you for having me. And it's also like food for thought, right? A lot of thinking also, right? What's next? Um, so we will just take a few more minutes. Uh, we have some upcoming events for AITP LA for June and July, and we just wanted to let you know about those events. Uh, we have event on data science and predictive analytics, and it's going to be a panel. Uh, it's coming up in June on June 22nd. It's going to be a virtual meeting with uh, pre-networking uh, Zoom uh, before that. And then in July, we are going to have an in-person networking event. So stay tuned for our events. You can sign up um, by going to aitpla.org and put in your email address and you'll be informed about the upcoming events. Uh, and then uh, please do give us uh, your survey. Uh, your feedback on our survey. I have posted the survey link on our chat. This will help us to plan uh, future events for AITP LA. And I thank you all for coming today and staying all the way to the end for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.